We have all heard of groupthink. You know, that phenomenon where we're all in the same room and we magically agree on everything. The ideas start flowing. Yes, 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 yes. But in actuality, we're just conforming. And the final decision might not be a good one. The repercussions for groupthink? Eh, maybe a bad idea. Something that didn't work. But not normally this. Yeah, at that point, um, the Serac started fracturing um, and, and killed several people. Several were uh, benighted and either fell uh, trying to descend the next day or were hit by a subsequent ice fall. When groupthink goes really, really wrong. Well, I think it, it became a follow the leader sort of mentality, uh, to, to be um, quite frank. You know, in terms of. Uh... Welcome to Mountain Meister. Who are the Mountain Meisters? Committing to the goal and galvanizing you and your team behind that one single focus. Being at peace with that fear and being okay with it. You gain a real appreciation for your life and for what you have. Learn about their extreme lives on rock, snow, and ice with your host, Ben Shank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mountain Meister. Today with me, I have Dr. Eric Meyer. Dr. Eric Meyer. Dr. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, sitting here in uh, rainy Steamboat Springs, Colorado right now. Yes, it seems to be raining everywhere in the country today, which is unfortunate. Although, when our listeners hear this, it might not be raining where they are. So, lucky you, listener. Anyway, what kind of doctor are you, Eric? I'm, I'm actually uh, a trained uh, anesthesiologist, uh, but... I guess part of my avocation and even vocation has been uh, mountain and wilderness medicine with, uh, with a special interest in, in high-altitude physiology and medicine. Yes, definitely want to get to that in a little bit. First of all, I've been knocked out before, and that's about the extent of my knowledge of anesthesiology, if I can say it correctly. What does an anesthesiologist do besides put people to sleep? <laughs> Well, we wake them back up. And, uh, <laughs> Good. Thank it's, you. It, it's definitely a round trip. Um, <laughs> and uh, a lot of what we do is, is geared at uh, relieving um, all types of pain. You know, pain, uh, obviously, uh, taking away uh, sensation and pain and consciousness during surgery, uh, but also managing pain after surgery and getting patients to you know, their, their full state of recovery as, as soon as possible comfortably. And we also get involved in chronic pain management, um, cancer pain management, and uh, injection therapy. I'm not sure if there's any truth to this at all, but I feel like I've heard this. Has there been a lot of advancement in anesthesiology in the past like 40 years or so? I, I feel like it's gotten much, much safer. Were there doubts about it many years ago? Oh, there's been tremendous uh, advances in in the specialty of anesthesiology over the last 40 years. You know, for example, uh, back say in the 1960s, the the rate of someone dying during uh, an anesthetic, a routine uh, surgical anesthetic, was something like one in 1,500. You know, and that's decreased now to something less than one in 300,000. So uh, it's it's been a tremendous advancement, both in the technology of, the, of monitoring that we are able to use, the medications, the, the complexity of surgeries ha- has increased enormously, and. Yeah, a lot of the surgeries now that are done minimally invasively um, are more complex. They take longer. Um, we're doing them on, on older and sicker patients. So it's, uh, it, it's really grown along with the advancements in surgical techniques. Very cool. So let's move on to the mountain stuff because that's why you're here today. Um, sure. so, so I don't really know too much about actually what the role of a doctor is on the mountain. So let's first talk about that. What what's your role compared to just somebody else who's on the expedition? Yeah. So so the the preparation uh, you know uh, actually starts um, you know, well before the expedition. You know, in terms of my role as a team physician, hmm. 
you know, with uh, recommendations uh, for immunizations and um, physical training, clothing uh, recommendations, uh, personal health tips, that that sort of thing. And and, uh, there's some travel medicine involved uh, as well, Um, knowing the area that you're traveling to and some specific uh, precautions in terms of uh, local disease uh, factors, things like that. Are, are doctors in high demand? Yeah, they tend to be. Yeah, and uh, th- you know, the longer and more remote the trip is, the, the the greater the sort of the need for someone that's that's trained medically to deal, you know, with any potential uh, medical eventuality uh, is is really helpful. And are you required to have a doctor, or is this just something intelligent to have when you're on a trip? <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's probably just an intelligent thing. You know, some it's it's a it's a policy with certain um, with certain commercial outfitters. Mm-hmm. Um, if not a doctor, then someone uh, someone sort of advanced with advanced training in uh, primary care medicine and emergency medicine is really really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So you're a climber yourself. And do you know how difficult it is to do certain things like turning around at the summit or maybe proceeding when you aren't feeling your best? Those are very difficult decisions that people have to make. Do you think that being a physician has impacted your decision making? I would imagine for the better. Yeah, I would say so. Um, one of the hardest things to do is is to be able to evaluate oneself uh, when you're in a stressful situation, and you know that therein lies a, a big part of the role of a of an expedition um, of a physician is to be able to be kind of an objective person to evaluate every single person on the expedition, whether they're staff or clients, um, and be able to sort of see how they're course of health is changing, um, you know, as the expedition progresses, um, you know, on these longer expeditions, everyone has good days and bad days, but it's sort of important to be able to, to, to track that, you know, sequentially for each member and to be able to, to recognize when someone's not doing well and may need to go down, for example, or maybe coming down with a, a respiratory infection and things like that. And, uh, you know, so, so the team physician's really sort of a, you know, kind of an overseer of, of the, the expedition's health. This is very interesting because I've heard from doctors that there are situations where a patient is in worse condition than they actually think. Think and they just don't complain about it or don't feel it as much, whatever it is. And then there's also this other side where people think there's really something wrong with them and then there's nothing wrong with them at all. Now, that's in a normal environment. In a mountaineering environment, I, it's got to be amplified, right? Oh, it, it certainly is. You know, I think, uh, you know, the type of person that uh, is attracted to going on expeditions is is certainly a, a, you know, usually a, a, a pretty fit and driven individual. And a lot of times they're tempted to push through things when, when they really need uh, some rest and recovery and, and some treatment perhaps. And and on the other hand, there's, 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 also, uh, there's also folks that – you know, in the stressful environment can sometimes um, psych themselves out and, and think that they're not as well as they actually are and, and sometimes just need some encouragement. Do you ever not get along or do these people not get along with you because of your diagnoses or opinions? Well, well, at the end of the day, you know, all I can really do is, is, is offer my knowledge and services. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if someone, uh, you know, refuses that, that's certainly their right. It does come into play, though, that in this decision making when you're part of a team environment and, and you know, the leader of the expedition is, is really relying on me to, to make uh, an objective evaluation of, 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 of people on the, on the expedition and, and not just for their own good, but for the, the good of the other members in the expedition. Yeah. I, I mean, these people may even not know what's good for them, though. It's, doesn't that bother you? I mean, some of these people might not be able to evaluate themselves as good as you can evaluate them. Right, right. And then that's where, you know, the experience of, of having been on numerous expeditions comes into play because, you know, you, you can hopefully uh, as a physician, in that in that setting, be able to, to to educate and impart some some degree of knowledge and and perspective, you know, to that person that may not really understand what's happening to their body. Mm-hmm. 
what kind of things happen to people's bodies? Just some throw out some examples. There, some of our listeners may not be familiar with uh, the situations that people encounter. Well, well, the biggest on on a uh, on an altitude uh, mountaineering expedition is is acute mountain sickness. Mm-hmm. You know, and that uh, there are certain you know key features of that. You know, headache, shortness of breath, nausea. You know, poor sleep, poor appetite. Uh, general fatigue, that kind of thing. Um, some of these can, can be rather nonspecific in the early stages, and, and that's why it's important to recognize early and engage the, the ascent uh, profile accordingly. Um, you know, that's probably the biggest, I would say, probably followed by respiratory illness. Uh, because when you're up at altitude, your immune system really takes a hit. Right. So what can begin as a viral upper respiratory illness can, can pretty quickly progress to uh, a more advanced bacterial bronchitis or a lobar pneumonia, that kind of thing, and you know, early recognition and, and treatment is is key to you know to to preventing those you know, those sequelae. And and uh, if you can recognize that and get that person uh, treatment, uh, a lot of times they, they can recover and continue on with the expedition. But if it goes beyond a certain point, it seems. Uh, it's just the body doesn't heal as well uh, up at altitude. So, so early recognition is super key. You've probably saved somebody's life of, or many people's lives. Well, we've certainly <laughs> had some close calls, and, and uh, there have been some times when we've, we've kept people uh, um, you know, uh, from, from further danger or uh, certainly uh, from death on a couple of occasions. Yeah. Very humble. Very cool, too. Let's move on to the K2 tragedy, which some of our listeners may know of. If you aren't aware of the K2 tragedy that happened in 2008, we had Chris Clinky on for episode number 25. I believe you and Chris know each other, right, Eric? Uh, we're very good friends, good yes. Friends, yeah. So they were both on the mountain that day, uh, but were not part of the 11 climbers that died on the mountain. Eric, can you just give us a quick synopsis on what happened that day for the listeners who aren't familiar? Well, kind of in a nutshell, um, what we had the situation on K2 was was – a lot of bad weather the first uh, two months of the expedition, and uh, you know everyone's uh, at that point looking for the the next possible nearest possible weather window to try and summit. We're all well acclimatized. We're, we're waiting to push to the summit, and and essentially everyone's watching the same three or four uh, satellite weather forecasts uh, that are indicating um, about three good days of weather in the beginning of August, and. Yeah, so what you had in essence was about eight teams um, with anywhere from you know one to uh, seven members uh, pushing for the summit at the same time, and, and essentially that meant about thirty people up at Camp Four on the shoulder of K two, and this created a real problem in the more technical sections up above uh, Camp Four to the summit, um, namely the bottleneck couloir, mm-hmm. which is. Uh, this is a narrow uh, ice couloir uh, that uh, approaches uh, 60 degrees in sections, and it is underneath about two football field lengths of overhanging ice. Um, and you know, these are called uh, seracs that are essentially ice uh, pinnacles. And uh, the route through the bottleneck takes you right underneath those seracs. So it's, uh, it's super dangerous, uh, not just from a climbing um, technical standpoint, but also from an objective hazard standpoint. And um, our team of uh, four uh, from our uh, total expedition of eight was poised to uh, summit uh, from Camp 4 on the day of uh, August 1st. We were not using oxygen. About half the other uh, the climbers were. And our strategy was essentially to come up from behind, follow the climbers that were on oxygen, who we believe would be moving faster than us and uh, and hopefully um, get up to the summit and back mostly in in the daylight but what we what had happened was uh everyone left essentially at the same time and was stacked up in the bottleneck as it were and as the sun was rising we got our first good look at what was up above us uh, in terms of the overhanging ice knowing that the sun was going to be out all day um also that we were at that point a couple hours behind schedule, and that, it's a very, very long summit day um, on K2. 
and realizing that we'd be coming down through this whole jumbled mess um, all in the dark, my teammates Chris Klinke, Fred Strang, and myself decided to turn back uh, at that point. Um, our other teammate, Searing Dorje Sherpa, was uh, a little bit ahead of us uh, and, and was uh, nearly through the bottleneck by the time we uh, turned around. So he decided to keep going. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things, you know, you, you put so much effort into preparing and getting to that point. Turning back is one of the most difficult things you can do. But you have to recognize what the right decision is um, uh, for yourself and, and act accordingly. So wh- wh- what happened after that essentially uh, w- was a series of ice falls during descent. Um, all parties summited basically in the late afternoon, uh, early evening. And uh, most were coming down in total darkness. And at that point, um, the Serac started fracturing um, and, and killed several people. Several were uh, benighted and either fell uh, trying to descend the next day or were hit by a subsequent icefall. And there were some people who were able to climb down, correct? There were. There were. Um, you know, essentially all but... Uh, all but nine made it down. So, uh, you know, there, there were uh, two individuals that that died uh, on the ascent uh, due to falls. And uh, my partner Fred Strang and I um, reclimbed the, the route um, above Camp Four to try to to try to save them, but uh, to no avail. Hmm. You talked a little bit about their being able to evaluate what the situation was in make a decision and in your case your decision was to not move forward for the people who did decide to move forward were they able to evaluate things in the same way that you were they just happened to make a different decision or were they not educated enough or not aware of the risks at hand well i think it it became a follow the leader sort of mentality uh to to be um quite frank um you know, in terms of uh, the radio traffic that was going on, um, there really wasn't much in terms of discussion about whether to go on or not. I think it was uh, everyone just following the person in front of them kind of thing um, for the most part. This is so interesting because the follow the leader mentality is something that people encounter all the time. This happens to be in a situation where following the leader is a matter of life and death. It's just something that I don't think we think about all the time. Right. Yeah, I think it's that's one of the things that's so important is is to is to sequentially reevaluate yeah. um, your situation with you know your personal health, the weather, the objective factors, the difficulty of the climbing, and and and, and uh, be honest with uh, yourself and with your teammates uh, in terms of your decision making. Yeah, constant vigilance. When you see a tragedy like this, does your outlook on climbing change? I mean, these things definitely do happen, and you're aware of them going into it. But when it actually does happen, does it change your outlook? Well, it certainly does. You know, uh, you know, you tend to choose your, you know, your climbing partners and the, and the trips you go on more carefully. I think when you when you've been exposed to to tragedy like this. Um, you know, you, you dig deep within yourself to ask yourself, you know, is, is this particular objective or mountain route, um, you know, worth, worth doing? Is it mean enough to me um, to engage in the risk? Mm-hmm. Has there ever been a time when you have chosen to keep climbing and other people have chosen not to? Um, I honestly, uh, I don't think so, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've always made uh, decisions with my with my climbing partners, and uh, and sometimes you know in a smaller group, you know you have to you know you have to acquiesce uh, to the desires and the the will and uh, preferences of your other partner. Um, I've certainly turned back on other mountains, and uh, you know I've had successes and failures. Uh, on Makalu in 2010, I turned around about 100 meters below the summit with one of our uh, with one of our Sherpas that couldn't continue, and he was ready to go down alone. And uh, I said, "No, I'm I'm not letting you go alone, down alone." And uh, yeah, descended with him. You know, it was just I felt it was the right thing to do, even though it was not the easy thing to do. 
Yeah, <laughs> definitely not. So last thing, I so I've never done any climbing remotely, remotely close to this, but it seems like it to me uh, that there are so many variables, so many things that can go wrong when accidents like these happen or when situations like these happen are they a result of irresponsible behavior or are these things just bound to happen because there are so many variables at play well i think it it certainly depends on the on the objective on the mountain um you know there are certain mountains that uh, that have a reputation for 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 really dangerous conditions um pretty much all the time Mm -hmm. and k2 is one of them annapurna certainly like that um it really, I think it's it's it depends on the it depends on the setting. Mm-hmm. Okay, moving on to a lighter topic, but equally as interesting. I have been doing some some looking into this whole who summited Everest first, and you've done a little bit uh, of research on this topic as well, and are familiar with it. So I'd love to ask you about this. In mountaineering, there's a lot of focus on on who does things first and who has summited or reached a certain point most. And this obviously makes sense because in both cases, it's uncharted territory. But with Everest, the highest mountain in the world, there's still controversy over who actually reached the summit first. Officially, for our listeners, if you didn't know, it's Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, who in 1953 summited. However... There are many people who believe that George Mallory did it in 1924, almost 30 years earlier. If you go way, way back into the Mountain Meister archives, in episode number seven, we talked to Rick Wilcox. And I wasn't even aware at that time that there were frozen bodies on Everest. Look how much I've learned since then. Is Mallory still frozen up there, Eric? Well, actually, Mallory was discovered... uh in uh, 1999 by uh, Eric Simonson and, and his uh, his group uh, that were that were looking for signs of, of Mallory or, or Irvine um, Irvine is still is still not been located there's uh, there's evidence to suggest that uh, that he was above uh, Mallory due to the to the break in the rope and the the, the fall that that Mallory evidently uh, took hmm. um, and this is a huge mystery did they did they in fact summit from the north side in 1924 you know that the, the thing to, there's things to keep in mind here you know obviously it was you know, the equipment wasn't as good they didn't have down then their boots uh, and the climbing equipment were really crude the oxygen systems were very very heavy but in, in fact the route was very different on the north side in 1924 than it is now there was a lot more snow in certain places that are are now exposed rock and quite difficult to climb technically now, um, so it's it is possible where where they were seen essentially near the, the second second step on the on the northeast ridge that they they could have perhaps climbed that um, in a lot more snow than there is now, which is all rock. That combined with just how extremely motivated and skilled you know, uh, especially Mallory was. Um, at the time, he's really the, the, the best climber of the day, um, had tremendous technical skill uh, for the day. And it was his third time on Everest. He was extremely motivated to get to the top. Um, he would not have turned around easily. And uh, the question remains from where they were last seen um, and disappeared into the clouds. Uh, did they get to the top or not? And, you know, is the evidence found on the camera that, uh, the two had between the two of them, uh, was not located on, on the body of, uh, George Mallory. So the assumption is that, uh, more than likely it's, it, it's on the body of Andrew Irvine. This is the mystery. Where is the camera? And it doesn't Where is the all. camera? It's- that's right. Um, you know, we've, we've been in talks with, uh, with people at Kodak that say if the camera was found, you know, almost certainly the images would be recoverable. Um, one of the, the big experts on this is, is Tom Holzel at the Boston Museum of Science, who's, who's really, he's researched this for over 30 years. And he has some, some very interesting ideas on, on 
you know, what might have happened, where the body might be located. We need um, to get this guy on the show for, yeah. uh, for a second opinion. <laughs> I, I, I would highly recommend it. He's, he's probably the most knowledgeable person uh, around on this. But interestingly enough, uh, my friend Siren Dorje Sherpa actually did see the body of Andrew Irvine um, in 1995 while he was uh, leading um, on the uh, final uh, pushes for the, uh, the Japanese 1995 uh, Northeast Everest expedition, which did do the, the first complete ascent of that route, um, saw the body, but came up next to it, but did not touch it, uh, did not have a camera, um, and subsequently has tried to get back to that spot um, without success. Wow. But, uh, this is, uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing uh, to hear him describe um, th- this body, which matches the description of um, of a Chinese climber that saw it in 1963, actually. Oh, so much stuff that still needs to be discovered. This is this is too cool. Also, I read two, and this is according to Wikipedia, so I trust that as a reliable source. Circumstantial evidence, including uh, Mallory's daughter, said that he carried a picture of his wife, which he intended leaving at the top. When they found Mallory, there was no picture in his pocket. Also, Mallory's goggles were in his pocket, which suggested that he was climbing at night, which was most likely after a summit during the day. That's correct, to, uh, to my knowledge as well. And uh, you know, that just uh, kind of thickens the plot even more, doesn't it? It? Sound, it sounds like you think that Mallory summited first. I, I think the odds are, are actually uh, better than 50-50 okay. that, that, that they did make it to the top. But, you know... Um, that, that sort of brings into play the the debate over well, what is a first ascent? You know, does it mean uh, oh, ascending and yeah. getting getting back down alive? Um, it's, some would say that it it does, but you know, in the truest sense, uh, you know, a uh, first ascent is a first ascent, and uh, you know, he gave everything he had, uh, and uh, I think we owe it you know, to mountaineering history to try to find out the you know the, the correct answer. Very, very good point you bring up there. Moving on, Eric, we like to ask our guests for a gear recommendation, and you are obviously familiar with lots of different type of gear and also probably some medicine. So give us some, give us some items, throw some items our way. What can we, what what do we have to have? Well, certainly, uh, you know, layering is important and, uh, you know, some of the newer fabrics that, uh, that, that can help you. I happen to like uh, the event fabric, uh, and I use several pieces made by Rob. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also a big fan of, of Big Agnes gear, and they're right here in Steamboat Springs. And uh, Bill Gamber is a good friend of mine, and I've worked with him on, on some product testing, and I'm, I'm very fond of their gear as well. And uh, you know, uh, quality merino socks are, are are really key part of of my equipment list. And uh, point six, uh, I think, makes uh, the best socks uh, around. I think socks are one of the most underrated pieces of equipment, or even pieces of fashion, or just comfort out there. If you have good socks, I think it makes you a much happier person. Definitely. Happy feet is a happy climber. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. We'll throw those on your Meister profile page on our website, Eric. For our listeners, check out highlights of Eric's episode there, mtnmeister.com. To wrap things up, I want you to give a piece of advice to our listeners dealing with decision making. And, you know, some of them may be adventures of your caliber or some not. It doesn't really matter. Do you have advice for how you make decisions, how you can make sound decisions, whether you're in a sticky situation on K2 or just in your everyday life? Well, I think, uh, you know, one thing I, that, that's super important to, to bear in mind is that, you know, everyone is ultimately responsible for their own, you know, health and safety and, and the, their own decision making. And it's so easy to get caught up in the groupthink uh, mentality when you're, when you're with a team. It's it's important when you reach those moments of self doubt to just stop, take a few deep breaths, remind yourself about why you're there, and of what the experience is about for you. 
and reassess, reassess your health, reassess your motivation, reassess, you know, your risk exposure and, uh, and, and make your own best decision uh, at that point. Awesome. Eric, thanks so much for joining us today on Mountain Meister. It's been lovely having you. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Ben. Thank you. For the listeners, the Meister fans out there, you can find, as I'm sure you know, full highlights of today's episode, Eric's gear recommendations, resources on the Mallory versus Irvine situation, all on our website, mtnmeister.com, under Eric's Meister profile page. Eric, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Eric Meyer. Dr. Dr. Eric Meyer. Learn something new every day. I like that. If you want to do some more learning, don't forget that Mountain Meister has now launched a newsletter. It's called Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Nope, it's not. It's called Keeping Up with the Meisters. <laughs> Subscribe to our newsletter. Go to our website, mtnmeister.com. There's a form right on the sidebar. You can fill that out. You'll also be entered to win a Jansport Day Pack, which is nice. Thanks so much for joining us today. Enjoy doing whatever you were doing while listening to this fantastic piece of art 